It is Tuesday, September 5th, 2023. This is another edition of Baseball Today. That is my man, Trevor Ploof. I am Chris Rose, producer Dan, along for the ride as well. Did you just say you were cold before we started? Like, chill. Dude, it just changed so quickly here in Los Angeles. Like, if you look outside right now, Chris, there's dark clouds. It's cold. Yeah. Good. It went from being 100 degrees to now yes. this. is a little uh, shock to my system, but I'll be okay. Okay, thank God. Somehow you'll make it and survive. Good. I know you look good. You look lean. You look strong. You're ready to go. Because I got five really tough questions that I did definitely send to you last night. But let's start with the tip of the cap. And it's the reason I'm wearing the Oakland A's lid. Uh, Janie McCauley, I believe is her name. She covers sports for the Associated Press in the Bay Area. And on Labor Day, she went around to a bunch of the laborers at the Coliseum up there in Oakland as they were taking on the Toronto Blue Jays. She introduced us uh, via her camera phone to a bunch of really interesting people. That group included 91-year-old security team member Gus Dobbins. Been here for about 35 years and still going strong. I ain't got no time for no jolling around. I got I got a job to do. <laughs> I... I don't know, man. I've listened to that like 15 times. I laugh every time. Good job, Gus. I love it. I ain't got no time for anything. I got a job to do. You know what's what's great about the Coliseum and I don't want to say about the A's organization because I don't think they really work for the A's organization, but at the Coliseum, there's a bunch of people, uh, including our guy here, who have been working for so long mm-hmm. and just really are a part of the place, you know, a fixture of the Coliseum. You know, you talk about uh, Michael Cigar is the uh, the photographer that's he's a rock, rock and roll photographer. He's always at the A's games. He's been there for like 50 years or something like mm. that. It's, so it's really cool. It's special what they have there and the fact that people have been there for decades and uh, really they're part of the fabric um, of that stadium. I, I got to meet a bunch of them, obviously, when I played there. So uh, I like it. It's a good tip of the cap, Chris. Good one. Good one. Gus, keep doing your thing up there, man, as long as it lasts. All right, uh, let's get it going with a little Shohei news. Uh, For the first time since tearing yet another ligament, his representation actually spoke to the media. Nez Bolello, who, of course, is the outstanding agent from CAA, um, gave us a little update. He said, first of all, this is a totally different tear than the one that forced Shohei to have Tommy John surgery several years ago. They're still figuring out their next move, but here's the outlook from Nez. The situation that we're in, he's going to be fine. And we all feel extremely positive based on information that we're getting that he's going to be fine. We just want to make sure that um, longevity is important because he loves to pitch. I'm just telling you right now that show has nothing. There's not a question in his mind that he's going to come back and he's going to continue to do both like we have the last few years that all of you have really enjoyed. Did you feel better after hearing from his rep? Yeah, I think so. I talked to Nez this morning. As I don't know if everyone knows. I've mentioned it before on the show. He's my former agent. I've known Nez since I've been was eight years old. So, um, first of all, Nez. Damn, he got great. his claws in you early, by the way, brother. Yeah. He's, he was a baseball coach around the area, former baseball player. Like, this uh-huh. guy, like, he's a good dude. Like, great. Um, ask, my, ask Olivia about Nez. She loves Nez. Um, skin looks great, too, Nez. Uh, I think, you know, his goal there was, you know, to get, I don't know, just to talk about the situation, you know, from their side and and what they're, what they're doing. You know, when I, I asked him about it, I said, you know, what was the point of that? And he's like, look, you know, the only news out there has been that it's a dire situation and, and Shohei's not going to pitch again. He's not going to pitch next year. And, you know, he's like, I just wanted to get out there and, and tell people what we've seen and what we've heard from doctors and, and really just kind of address it. They're letting he, – he's like, I want Shohei to go play baseball. He doesn't need to address me. He's like, I'll do it. And I think he I think he accomplished uh, what he set out to do, which was to get a little bit of light on the situation from people that are, you know, right there with it. You know, they're going – continuously getting opinions and stuff. And I think that – I do feel better about it. The tidbit of information that he did share, which he didn't have to share, the fact that it's not – the ligaments or the part of the ligament that was structurally repaired earlier. It's a different side. He he says there is going to be some procedure, but um, he'll definitely pitch again. I mean, this is the stuff that when something like this happens, 
and we don't hear from a certain side, you kind of start to assume the worst. And I think a lot of people around baseball have done that with Shohei because we just, we love him so much. We want him to be on the field. You know, like I said before, the only information we've gotten is like, this guy's hurt Mm -hmm. basically. And I think it's nice to hear it from the source uh, about some things that are going on around it. So I think he did a good job. I know later, later that day or yesterday, he came out with an oblique kind of strain. He ended up not, so I think I think Shohei's done for this year. I, I haven't heard that from Nez, but it seems to me like he's done. Probably should have been done uh, a, a while ago. But I think Nez sounded good, and I think that it was, to me, this is what it did for me. It made me remember that injuries happen, and they get fixed, and then you play again. And sometimes you need to be reminded of that. Right. It, well, here's the deal. I didn't get anything new from it outside of that. It's a different tear. And he said that according to the doctors that they have spoken with, that this is kind of the best case scenario. So that's all good. He did, as you mentioned, say that he's going to need a procedure. Now we don't know what that is. Basically all I know is that Nez has got his work cut out for him because instead of drawing up a contract that says $600 million on it, they might have to get very creative. They asked him, Because of this injury, do you think you'll go shorter deal or still try and push for a longer deal? He said, i got to be honest with you right now, I don't know. And I think he's being honest when he says that. I think he truly does not know and won't know until whatever procedure is done is done. The the problem is is that for us as baseball fans, we were about to embark on this incredible offseason journey. One like we had never seen before, ever. And so we get cheated of that to some degree. Once he has the surgery, which I hope happens as soon as possible, Shohei will have some peace of mind because he'll know a, a little bit more about a timetable. And if the these uh, surgeon says, hey, listen, you're not going to pitch next year. You're just going to DH and you won't be ready until May. So be it. The fear of the unknown is always the worst. Once yeah. we know, we'll have a better idea. So I don't feel any better than I did before yesterday. The one thing I did get out of that is that Nez, I've been around a lot of agents, is not agenty. He felt like mm-hmm. a human who was your friend. And that's why he kind of stumbled and stammered at times and repeated himself. I actually appreciated that because it felt like a human being talking about a real relationship instead of agent client. I mean, that's a, think about the situation that he's in. You know, there's only so much information that you want to really make public because totally. you got to you know, negotiate. This is, you got to negotiate and yeah, you, you'll eventually give up the, that information and, and medical records to teams that you are negotiating with. But yeah, no, like again, I've known him for a long time. You know, I'm a good people person. Like I'll read you in a freaking second. Mm-hmm. And that's a good dude. I think he did well by his client yesterday. All right, let's move on to the baseball on the field. A uh, bigger deal in the American league that your boy Royce Lewis, who just has star written all over him. It is third Grand Slam in eight games. The Twins blow out Cleveland 20-6 to six and now have a six-game lead in the AL Central. Or that the Astros blasted five homers. They topped Texas. They moved back into a first-place tie with Seattle atop the AL West. Well, you, I love what's happening in the AL West, Chris. I think it's going to come down to the last few days. Uh, it's a tough uh, – I think it was the sixth inning or maybe it was the seventh inning last night uh, for the – the Ranger Seeger boots that ball and they pile on, but mm-hmm. I'm going with Royce Lewis. You know, I'm going to talk about Royce Lewis. He, he does look like a star in the making yep. uh, a young dude who we talked about on this show. Like he, he reached out with Alex Kirloff to talk to Joe Maurer about hitting. Like he, he just gets it, man. And, and, and that swing right there. I know people are like, Oh, it's a two Oh fastball. Like what, what else is he going to do with it? Like, If you watch the rest of his swings in that swing, that was a very controlled swing right there. And that was after Lucas Giolito was – I think he had walked three of the previous four batters all over the place. You don't know you're going to get a pitch right down the middle there, but you need to look for it, and you always need to cheat with your eyes, not with your body. That's a Paul Molitor quote. His body was very still and calm right there. Like That was a toned-down swing. The end result was violent. Um, but his mindset was perfect right there. So Royce is a guy who, you know, Rod Carew put this on him years ago. He said, this guy is something special. And Rod Carew does not say that about anybody, dude. So he labeled him as that. He's dealt with some injuries, but now he's healthy and he's he's a difference maker. 
And the Twins, like, they're going to win the division. If they get into the playoffs and and are going to make some noise, I mean, this guy's going to be right in the middle of the lineup providing energy like he has been. I mean, you talk about three grand slams in however many days. It's ridiculous. Uh, but he just looks like a polished player right now and one that we're going to be talking about for a long time. So I think that was big. The game itself, Chris, was just a travesty. Like, I can't. We need to figure out something. I don't want to go into it too much about bringing a position player in the six. I know what Terry Francona was doing. He was saving his bullpen. He knew the game was lost. I understand that. But are you kidding me? Four innings of a position player? Like, that's hey, not it. I don't get it. But Royce is kudos to Dave, I'll end with kudos that. Kudos to David Fry. Good for him, man. Threw almost 70 pitches. He became the first position player to throw at least four innings since Jose Okendo in 1988. And, oh, by the way, that was a 19-inning game. So he's kind of four first into action how about um, joey gallo's homer off him yeah oh i mean listen poor guy he's, he said i was just trying to throw as many strikes as possible his actually his strike to ball ratio was exceptional it's just a lot of his strikes ended up in the seats um we i told you before yesterday or even when the guardians got all these guys on waivers that it was still a major uphill climb like they just they were probably going to have to sweep this series and we all know it's tough sweeping a good team so I was sad. Uh, I was demoralized in part because my buddy Lucas Giolito had a disastrous debut for my baseball team. It was so bad. I forced the family to go eat ice cream last night. That's how bad it was. We all when got I texted you, did you really not? You really haven't seen the game? Joke. Joke? Was, okay, okay. I was fucking around. But um, I'm not saying this because I don't want to talk about the Cleveland-Minnesota game. I am worried about the Texas Rangers. I tweeted something about it yesterday. I said, I'm not even a Rangers fan, and it just makes me sick to watch their bullpen. Now, this really started with Andrew Heaney. He couldn't get through five innings. He had a 3 nothing lead. It seems like every day, the Rangers just ought to start with like a 3 or 4 nothing lead because that's the way every game starts for them. And then they just fuck it up. They have dropped 13 of their last 17. Since August 16th, they are tied for the worst record in baseball with the Colorado Rockies, who are a putrid team. The Texas Rangers are not that bad, but for God's sakes, when Bruce Bochy and Mike Maddox look at each other and it gets to the sixth inning and their starters run out of bullets, and by the way, that's going to happen way earlier than the sixth inning tonight because Nathan Evaldi's thrown in a game for the first time since mid-July with no rehab starts. So he's going to go like three innings, and now they have to fill six innings. So when that happens, Bochy and Maddox look at each other and they go, what the fuck are we going to do now? Like, it's... It's a disaster. It's a disaster. Chris Young did not get them enough help. They knew that Chapman and Stratton was not going to be enough, and those guys haven't been good. It is horrible watching this. We thought, well, maybe this has a chance to be a three-team race. The, the Rangers are hanging on by their fingernails on the edge of a cliff because the bullpen sucks so bad. Up, watch. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It, it has been a tough watch. I believe I just did the math. I think they're straight up 500. There are 500 ball clubs since June 1st. And I get it. Listen, they, they've they had to deal with a lot. They missed Seeger for a few weeks, and he has been out of this world great. Jacob deGrom got six starts. I, I understand that. Like, I'm, I'm with you. But, man, the easiest thing to revamp at the trade deadline is your bullpen. They picked up Chapman at the end of June. They picked up Stratton at the end of July. And that has not been enough. Hasn't been enough. And Chris Young, of all people, should know. I know they don't play outdoors anymore in Texas. But your bullpen in that state is always the first one to go. And it's what, you know, the Astros in recent years remade their bullpen. And it ended up helping them get a second ring. It was There was a huge component for them. I mean, it's only so much pitching help this guy could bring in. He revamped the rotation before the year. He brings in two starters plus Chapman hey. plus Stra I mean, dude, that's a lot of that's a lot of bodies to bring in, Chris. You can't just bring in like thirty relievers. Well, hold on, hold on. He couldn't have gotten a spare reliever in the Scherzer deal. I'm just saying, like, it's not like he didn't do anything. And I and I and I'll say this. I, I get what you're saying, and and I just uh, told you there are 500 ball clubs since the beginning of June, but I think 
again, you put this team in the postseason. Everything changes in the postseason, dude. Well, like everything on. changes. We pick, you you we, have any faith in them when you get to the when you get to the one hundred percent. I have no faith. One hundred percent. No do. way. Yes, it's, it's all about your bullpen in the postseason. There's no. It's way. all about. It's about who out homers the other team in no, the postseason. And guess what this team can do? They can absolutely bang. They can overcome some bullpen deficiencies. Now, do you want to have a strong bullpen going in? Sure, but. Chris, again, let's think back to the last three, four years in the World Series. All those teams that won, save a few, had bullpen issues coming into it, including the Atlanta Braves, including the Washington Nationals. You can ride one or two guys if they get hot in the postseason. We've seen it time and time again. So, like, is it bad right now? Would I want them to be running in with a, a flush bullpen going great? Sure, but that's not baseball. Sometimes Ooh. sometimes you just got to get hot at the right times. But I'm not willing to give up on this team whatsoever. I no. want to see them stick around for the last few weeks because they all play each other atop that West. But, man, it is, it is ugly. We'll talk more about this series tomorrow because Scherzer and Verlander go it. Should be good. Today's episode of Baseball Today, it is sponsored by your good friends over at Shady Rays. I want you to take on the sun with gear that is built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarized shades at a very affordable price. Plus, there's a brand new offer. We've told you about it recently. You can get 30% off the custom Jimmy and Jake collab shades. Use the code JM30. I tried both pair on when we were shooting floorball recently. They are both exquisite. You kind of get a different feel with them. You know, Jake, you got the well-dressed Wednesday. Jimmy, you've got the guy who's just willing to grind, grind, grind while still looking cool. On top of that, Shady Rays offers a world-class product. It's just as good as any expensive pair ever worn. Durable frames, extremely clear optics, and they've got the most insane protection in the history of eyewear. Every pair of these bad boys is backed by lost and broken replacements, which means if you lose or you break a pair, even on day one of ownership, you call up to Shady Rays. You're like, oh, God damn it. I forgot my sunglasses. I have no idea where they are. They say, Mr. Rose, who got your address on file. We'll send them out right away. OK, well, wh- don't you want an explanation? No, they don't want any explanation. They don't want anything from you. They just want you to be happy and looking great. And exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. So head on over to ShadyRays.com. Use that code word today. You're going to get 50% off two plus pair of polarized sunglasses. While you're there, you get 30% off the limited edition Jimmy and Jake collab shades with the code JM30. You might not be as cool as Jimmy and Jake, but you can certainly look that sweet, just like Trevor Plouffe. All right, we continue on, kind of take a step away from the baseball world to talk about stuff we don't want to talk about, but we have to. Dodgers are starting a series in Miami tonight. Julio Urias did not make the trip and probably won't be with the team for the foreseeable future. News broke on Monday that Urias was arrested on suspicion of felony domestic violence late Sunday night. This comes four years after the pitcher was arrested on misdemeanor suspicion of domestic battery. He was never charged for that crime. He did serve a 20-game suspension under the uh, violating uh, Major League Baseball rules. We are talking strictly about baseball today because we don't know enough facts about the other stuff. Can Julio Urias pitch for the Dodgers again? This season? He's a free agent to be. I know. If you're an organization and you stood behind him, you gave him a second chance after a 20-game suspension, and now this. I I don't think he was ever going to sign back with the Dodgers. Um, but I, I I think that this does end the relationship between Urias and the Dodgers. Yes, mm-hmm. if you're asking me that, in my truthful opinion. Now, again, yeah, we don't have all the facts in front of us or we don't know what happened, and there's a lot of things that could come of this. But I think the way the Dodgers have approached this, uh, especially like you said, this is, this is the second time this has now happened. He did serve that suspension. We saw what happened with Bauer. I think that they're an organization that, and kind of rightfully so, should really just not be associated with this type of behavior. So if you you want me to answer your question, I don't think he pitches for the Dodgers again. Do I think he pitches for somebody else again? Uh, We have to see what happens with this case. Right. I think there's there's a chance that if something comes out and it's something bad and he ends up getting 
charged, convicted of of uh, domestic uh, violence, then I think that the chances of him pitching for another team again are probably slim. To be honest with you, uh, if the charges get dropped and he doesn't and he doesn't uh, have any uh, conviction against him, then I think a team will take a chance on him. He might have to serve another suspension. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff out there. I, I don't think the Dodgers were going to bring him back, and I think this definitely ends ends the relationship. So there's a lot of components of this, some of which we can't talk about because, as Trevor said, we don't know facts at this point. And so it'd be, we would be assuming, well, if he did this, then this. All we know are few things. Nobody has ever been twice suspended under this act, this violence act in Major League Baseball. This is going to be something that's going to weigh heavily on Commissioner Rob Manfred because by the agreement, you don't have to be formally charged or found guilty yeah. in order to be penalized by a suspension. You can say, oh, well, that's not fair. That These are these are rules that have been agreed upon between the owners and the players. Yes. Okay? So you don't have anything to complain about. The rules are the rules. The other aspect of this is what does it do to the team right now? I'm sure that a lot of those guys in that clubhouse, just like the Rays players were several weeks ago when we heard first heard rumblings about the Wander Franco stuff, they're trying to compartmentalize. They're trying to move on, but I'm sure some of them are shaken. I don't think there's oh, any question about it. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and, and, it's tough to talk about like the baseball aspect of this because the totally. allegations are serious. And I just, I, I have no, like no tolerance whatsoever. I'm, I'm a zero tolerance domestic violence guy right here. So I, I just, this, this to me is just unacceptable. Uh, really like, why are we putting ourselves in any position like this? That's kind mm-hmm. of my thought process on it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this leaves, if we do have to talk about the, the, baseball Which, side of this we do we have to it's because fine. this is part of what our job is it really is a blow to the Dodgers rotation I know he hasn't been pitching great as of late but I I'm was a believer in the fact that he could turn it around postseason comes around things change now it's what's the rotation going to be like in the playoffs huh? in the playoffs excuse me you have you got Kershaw and you got Bobby Miller and you got Lance Lynn those guys are a lot for a start now all of them they are and then after that it's Pepio, it's Sheehan, it's maybe Walker Bueller or piggybacking, right. bullpen days, all this stuff. So it definitely changes the Dodgers' equation of how they're going to approach a, a postseason um, starting pitching lineup because Urias is going to be in it. Whether he was struggling at the end of the year or not, he was going to start a playoff game, but now he's obviously not. He has 23 career playoff appearances, including a half dozen starts in ERA, a little bit over three and a half. So he was a guy that they could rely on. And let's remember who was on the mound in 2020 when they won the World Series it for the first time since 1988. He was a huge part of it as he moved to the bullpen and gave them a lot of meaningful innings. That's the baseball side of it. The rest of it will play out as it plays out. We will promise to talk about and it. Dude, when... What? Never put yourself in this situation, guys. We're talking about a freaking guy who is just about to become a free agent at what age? Well, he's 27. 27? Trevor, what are you doing? I know this goes way beyond that, way beyond that. I know. I'm just saying what, what? And, and by the way, this isn't, I want to get this very clear. This is not a, a sports issue. This is not a baseball player issue. This is an issue. It's an issue in every, there are, podcasters there are attorneys there are people who work in sanitation there are every walk of life unfortunately is where we have to talk about this for god's sakes if you have some sort of anger management issue and or if you have friends who do don't ignore this stuff god it just ruins lives i i can't and you're right i feel sick that we have to talk about the baseball side of it but we do this is what we do this is what we do, and it is a it's a fairly sizable baseball story. Okay? But let's I we just, can move on. I just I, I can't. Know. I just can't. It makes I, me upset because like, come on. Yeah. Like be like, I don't know if people are gonna like that I say this or not, but like be a man. Like men don't touch women. That's I, like 
number like number one rule. I've already started telling my son about that. He's eight Good. years old, dude. You need like, to. You need to at a very young it's, age. It's one of the first rules you learn as a as a man. You don't touch women. You don't. Right. Hey, listen, you can raise your kids any way you want to. I have actually used when something like this has happened from a very early age. And people know I have two sons that are almost 23 and almost 18. We t- started talking about it. every time an incident would come up, we would reinforce it. Hey, you know that it's not OK when a woman says no, you stop everything. If you're feeling angry or upset, you leave where you are. You call me, you call your mother, you call somebody else. Now, I don't know if it's right for everybody. That's how we've done it. I'm not here to preach. It's just how we've done it. You can All preach. Right. Well, Fine, but I, I can't tell people how to run their lives. I'm I think you can oh. tell them that one. I think that's okay. That's like a universal truth there. Yeah, but I mean, like I said, maybe that doesn't work for everybody. I hope it would. But also be the right example. Yes, totally. My, my father was for me, and I'm trying to be it for uh, Josh and Brady. Let's get back to the games we play. Biggest story out of the NL wildcard on Monday. Justin Steele shutting down the Giants. The Reds uh, winning a big one against the Mariners. Phillies posting a seventh straight multi-homer game. They went out in San Diego. Merrill Kelly, a career-high 12 strikeouts to help the D-backs stay in it. Anything catch your eye or ear there? Uh, continuing on Justin Steele, just how good he's been, you know, shutting down that Giants team. He went eight innings pitched, only two hits, 12 Ks. I mean, he's gone 20 out of 26 quality starts this year. He's the main reason that the Cubs are where they're at. If without Justin Steele, what are the Cubs, to be honest with you? I mean, this guy has been, he's been as consistent as consistent can be. And that to me is, I feel like, he's forced his way into this like elite pitcher conversation, Mm -hmm. right? Like we never really were giving him that credit, even at the beginning of the year. It's like, okay, Hey, nice, nice first win the Cy Young. This guy has, yeah, this guy has put himself. Now, when you talk about the elite pitchers in the national league, you have to mention Justin Steele or else you're a casual. Right. So I think it's a big deal. And, And again, it's like, he forced himself into the conversation by the level of play this year, and I love when guys do that. It's not a brand name. He was a fifth round pick out of high school, I believe. Like, not, I don't know what his prospect status was like. Probably a, an okay type prospect. I don't think he was like some number one hype prospect. This guy just came up and pitched lights out, and he's been doing it all year long. Like I said, twenty out of twenty six quality starts. He's given now fourteen innings in a row without giving up a run. So, keep it up, Steele. Yep, he's been great. Um, the other part of that equation was who they did it against, and it's San Francisco, who's really struggling at the time where they need to kind of get their shit together. That's back-to-back shutout losses. The game before that, they scored one run. The game before that, they scored three runs. You know, they got some veterans on that team. Let's let's go. I know that we've talked a lot about their young kids and stuff like that and them being, you know, relying on some of those guys to get it done. Everybody got to let's go. Let's go. They're one game back now of the last wild card spot. Yep. And you have plenty of time. Oh, yeah. Just let's shake it off. Let's make it. Andre, six and a half games back. All right. We started uh, this show with Angels talk. Unfortunately, we're going to end it with Angels talk. According to Sam Blum, who covers the Halos, reporters stopped to ask Anthony Rendon in the clubhouse about his injury, possible timetable for a return. They haven't gotten a lot of answers recently. The third baseman said, no abba uh, no pardon me the third on, baseman bro. said no habla inglés today and left the clubhouse your thoughts i don't really know how to answer this question c rose oh i, I mean, do then let me go okay i know hold on i know then what let me you're go. gonna do you want to just go okay yeah fuck it I, i've had enough of his act he's tired <laughs> he he is so tired for years all i heard this is what i heard from guys who played with him i was like What's the deal with Rendon? They're like, listen, dude, he can mash. He can mash. Like, he is as good bat to ball dude as I've ever played with. Unbelievable player. I was like, does he like it? They're like, nah, he doesn't. He's good at baseball. So that's why he plays. The, the whole act is so tired. It's been tired forever. It was tired in Washington. It's tired now. I get it. It's not fun being injured. Like, you want to be out there? I think he does, at least. I'm not so sure about that anymore. But you know what? 
be a fucking professional. We hear it all the time from management and from managers. Hey, he's a professional ball player. This is not professional. Somebody has got to stand up. To, and here's a lack of leadership. And I don't know whose job it is to get to sit his ass down. Really, it's his job because he's over 30 and he's been in this game for a long time. But somebody should sit him down and be like, listen, bro, when somebody asks you a question, you can be frustrated. You could be upset. You might not even like the question, but don't act like some immature little kid. I, I've had enough of it. It really is a tired act, and I have to imagine that there's guys in the clubhouse that are rolling their eyes. Like, they're going out to bust their ass every day after a horseshit season and everything that they've been through and no habla inglés today. Well, by the way, you do speak English because you said the word today. Fuck. I want to know the context and the tone again context. of that. I wasn't a club. I I do. I Stop. do because this you know, is not one. This is not one that needs context. I'm not. I'm honestly not trying to defend him. And I, and I was actually going to be a little bit hard on him. I knew you were going to be harder on him. There's been a there's been a a bunch of stuff going on with him this season. I mean, do you recall when he almost punched a fan in Oakland? Yeah, I sure do. He got suspended for it. Yep. So to I me, do. that was that's soft. Like, dude, I don't care what someone says to you. Like, go to the security guard, let them handle it. Like, you just, you don't interact with fans that way. To me, that was a red flag. It was soft. I don't like, and, and I've heard guys, other guys, not just Rendon, uh, oh, I don't really like the game of baseball. And it's like, dude, you know what? You can get burnt out on it 100%. But mm -hmm. don't tell me I don't like it and I just play it because I'm good on it. Because that shit is, that to me is tired. I like to use the word tired because that's a great, that's used in the clubhouses a lot. Uh, I, you know, he's got to figure it out, dude. He's got three more years on this contract. He's with, he's with a, a franchise that's seemingly going nowhere. So somebody does have to talk to him. And you, when you brought up that point, like somebody has got to be a leader on that team. It's Mike Trout and Mike, Tr there's nobody else, dude. Like Mike has to sit him down and talk to him, I guess. Like who else, that's who else on that team, by the way, who else that, on that team can talk to this guy? That's embarrassing. Okay. That's embarrassing that Mike Trout, who is, who came up at this basically the same time as Anthony Rendon. I'm saying he's the only one that can sit and talk to this guy. But no, it's uh, it's fine. Your teammates, doesn't matter the age. Like uh, somebody does need to sit down and talk to them. Cause here's what's gonna happen. You either get it under control and say, dude, you have to be an example and you need to be a leader on this team because you're making 30 plus million dollars for the next three years, and people are gonna look up to you no matter what, because you're a veteran in the clubhouse. So you either got to do that or you got to just take it to the house, bro, because you can't sit in here, you know, moping around and acting like I don't want to be here. That's cancerous in a clubhouse, right? So, like, I get it. You mentioned it. He's been hurt. That shit sucks. And it puts me, when I was hurt, I wasn't, I was like not the same person. I wasn't, I, it wears on you mentally. So if that's the case, he needs to get help with that as well. Like you have to learn how to deal with that too. And there's people out there that can help you. And I'm sure there's people in the angels organization that you can talk to about it, but like, you can't just, you can't be the guy in the clubhouse. that's like, I don't want to be here. Like you can't do that, man. So he has to figure his act out for sure. He's owed over 115 million with three more years after this season. He's played 148 games total over the last three years and OPS around 700. It's actually, you know, who should talk to him. Hmm. Consummate professional teammate clubhouse glue guy, Mike Mustakis. Mm, that's a great call. And you know what? Mike probably would. And he would tell him, listen, bro, fucking snap out of it. Yep. That's a great one. Like that. All right. We're back at it again on Wednesday. Uh, check our social media for what time we're going. You can join us live on the AMP app. Just download it onto your iPhone. You can be a part of the conversation. And we always love hearing from our John Boy Media community. For our one-of-a-kind producer, Dan Rourke, the uber-talented Trevor Plouffe, I am Chris Rose. We will see you Wednesday on Baseball Today.